It's warm outside, the bugs are feasting, and the animals are lively. What better time than now to go camping? Just be careful, wild animals can be dangerous. So can people, and the unexplained. Campers do go missing from time to time, and I wonder why. Some of whom are never seen again. Enjoy these allegedly true, scary camping stories. Go to darkstories.org to send me your scary experiences, and stop by eeriecast.com for more of my creepy podcasts. Now, let's begin. Camping can be fun, sometimes. From PJ. This happened during the summer I graduated high school, a few years back now. Since the end of that summer, I've moved for college. My high school was in a suburban setting, but the campus was surrounded by a good amount of forest. I joined the cross-country team in ninth grade, and that kind of developed my love for hiking and exploring. Often we'd run on the trails that were dispersed through the forest, especially behind the high school. Some of these trails stretched for many miles. I recall one day our coach was unable to make practice after school due to being sick. Our team captain told us we could basically free roam the forest that day and explore the forest in our own groups if we desired. This was the day I knew I would always have a desire to explore the unknown. My friends and I were jogging around on unused trails and came across an old shack containing various old tools and weapons. Nothing was unordinary besides the fact that there were a bunch of things like axes and daggers hidden inside the place, all of which were mostly in old and brittle condition. The area was abandoned and in the middle of the forest. No one seemed to have come here in a while. We didn't think much of it and labeled it as a good find. Later on that day after cross-country practice, me and two of my friends came back to the high school to explore some more. This time, we went in the complete opposite direction of where the shack was, and ended up finding an abandoned trailer this time. The trailer would have been that sort that you would see on the back of semis. It was at that point of dilapidation and really had nothing left to offer. Yet, there was no truck in sight. That made us wonder how it got into the woods in the first place, without a clear path long enough to even transport to this location. Next to the back of the truck, a single-story makeshift-looking house that was clearly the victim of a fire sat. The place was practically crumbling and nothing inside was worth taking a look at. However, the trailer had some interesting stuff inside. Although it was peculiar finding this stuff deep in the woods, a lot of the stuff inside the trailer was either junk that appeared to be old, or antiques that ranged from typewriters to dressers that appeared to be made back in the 1900s. We labeled this as our biggest find yet, and we were really excited. That wrapped up the day, though. A lot of other cool and odd things had happened in our expeditions to the forest since then but nothing as bizarre and freakish as what I'm about to tell you. So the purpose of stating all of this was to explain how my love for hiking and exploring came into play. Since then, me and my friends have continued to go to this forest behind the high school from time to time to explore and hang out. Now as officially graduated seniors, my friends and I decided to have one last time in those woods before we split off in our own unique directions in life. While it was a day filled with deep nostalgia and sadness, reminiscing the good old days, we also got the fright of our life. This time we dedicated the whole day to the woods. We got ready in the morning and rode our mountain bikes into the forest, bringing camping supplies and such. That day was different as we decided we were going to camp overnight in the woods. After all, we had never done that before, and as our last time coming here together, we figured we'd better make it memorable. There were four of us in total. We told our parents we were going to stay the night at one of our friends' houses. Looking back, I kind of wish that's what we ended up doing. 
Anyway, we got there in the morning and found an area to set up camp. It was at the bottom of a really steep elevation, and there was a clearing at the bottom with an already made fire pit, because apparently someone had already been there in the past. There were beer cans and ammunition shells scattered everywhere. I've come to learn that this area of the forest was actually used as a shooting range back in the day. We started on our hike, and pretty much screwed around all day on the trails. We graffitied a bridge about a mile down the trail where our campsite was, writing stuff like so-and-so was here, and such. We figured we had to document our last day, and all the other days we had spent in this awesome forest, before we all left for college. When you entered the forest, there was a main path that went straight with many side paths. The area where we camped was about a quarter mile into the trail from the high school to the left. If you kept going straight on the main path, you would eventually get to the bridge where we had our little art exhibit. To the left was where the shack was, and to the right was where the trailer was, on each of their own paths a few miles in. And if you went straight past the old broken bridge, you'd go further into the woods, where many more trails could be found that we hadn't been on completely. The day went well with absolutely nothing wrong so far. Thankfully, we hadn't run into anyone else, because a lot of the stuff we ended up doing was definitely not allowed on private property. Soon it was getting dark, and we began to get ready for our campfire. Beers in hand and memories on our mind, we had started our nostalgia trip. Things had been going great. At one point, the fire had begun to die down, and we decided to let it go. After all, the embers would stay alive for a while after, and that was all we really needed at this point. By then, it was around one in the morning, and we had all fallen asleep. I suddenly woke up, not knowing what time it was. Everyone else appeared to be asleep, though. I didn't move much, because shortly after I woke up, I heard something. It sounded like footsteps crunching on beer cans and earth. I truthfully couldn't tell if it was on two feet or four yet, but I just assumed it was an animal walking around the campsite in search of food or something. That's when I realized we were complete idiots for not cleaning up after ourselves and putting our stuff away before dozing off. But I was far from guessing right. At least I think I was. I hadn't made a single motion since I'd awakened, and even worse, whatever was near us, it was not facing in my direction. The way I was then, I was completely vulnerable to whatever this thing was. That's when I suddenly heard a new set of footsteps approaching the campsite. There was dead silence besides these footsteps rummaging around our campsite. That's when I made out whatever these things were had to be bipedal. The crickets and frogs in the area ceased to make noise. A few moments later, everything was dead silent, including the noise of whoever was in our camping area. The sounds of these footsteps stopped as suddenly as they came. I lifted my body up to look frantically around the campsite and woke up my friends. I noticed that the embers had been put out by water, which none of us had done, and smoke was gently wafting into the air. We were almost in complete darkness. I reached for my phone and saw that it was two in the morning now. It's as if whatever these things were knew the moment that we had all fallen asleep. The fire being put out must have happened right before I woke up. My friends were all awake then, wondering why I'd woke them all up. All I could say was I heard footsteps by our campsite, but they were audibly gone now. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an ear-piercing scream shot out into the air from the path taken to get to our camping spot at higher elevation. As I looked into that general direction, I could see at the top of the trail something looking down at us. Another scream rang out. It almost sounded like an Aztec death whistle. If I were to compare it to something, yet it was much lower in tone, 
with an almost insect-like clicking noise to it. I nearly soiled myself. That's how taken aback I was. We were in utter shock, unable to move. That's when it hit me. Where was the other thing? It had accompanied that figure at the camp. Was it near us? I only saw one at the top of the trail. I never found out, though. Whatever was at the top of the trail had now begun to skulk off further, deep into the woods, towards the bridge. All I could make out was its tall, slender silhouette. Where its eyes were supposed to be were two small, eerily green, reflecting slits. I was scared beyond my wits. I told everyone we were going to make a run for it. After all, we weren't too far from the high school, about a quarter mile away, give or take. We ditched everything and ran. We decided we'd come back for anything we left the next day with a bigger group of people. We ran straight out of the woods, not hearing anything else besides our own footsteps. We all snuck into my friend's basement after that, through an emergency hatch, and stayed there for the rest of the night, making sure to lock and secure any form of entry out of paranoia due to what we just witnessed. Never in my life have I experienced something so terrifying as that. Never in my life had I seen or heard anything remotely similar to the sound of whatever it was we heard that night. We went back two days later and found everything there intact. However, two of the four bikes had been thrown around and scratched up. Our sleeping bags had been shredded and slung upon tree branches way up high. Everything was just a disturbing mess. The forest had resumed with its sound of nature, signifying that anything dangerous was most likely far off. Whatever was out there that night had come back in an attempt to find us again, but only found the remains of what we left behind. What I'll never know is why those things were near our camp or in the forest and what their ultimate goal was in coming near us. I mean, maybe it could have been some sort of group messing with people, but the idea of that seems really far off. It wouldn't fully explain all the incidents that happened that night. I also learned that there was an ancient cemetery somewhere along the path if you went straight past the bridge a few miles on a discreet side path. My cross-country captain apparently found it with a few others when I mentioned the whole incident on a group chat. Maybe they were ghosts. Maybe they were wendigos. I really have no idea. Regardless, I still have trouble thinking about it to this day. But I know deep down that whatever happened that night, whatever those creatures were, they had bad intentions and were likely pure evil. I think a skinwalker was following us at Philmont. From Kinda Scared 123. I'm a Boy Scout, and the pinnacle of scouting is considered to be Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. Philmont is land owned in New Mexico, where crews of scouts plan a backpacking trip to different locations over the course of many days. I'm not good at backpacking, so on this trip I expected hardship and pain, but not fear. But Boy Scouts is about expecting the unexpected, and this experience scared me so bad that I needed somewhere to talk about it and share it with others. In fact, we're riding back now to go home. I just need to get this off my chest. Things began happening around the middle of the trek. Me and a friend of mine were in our tent talking after a long day of hiking. Philmont has quite a few ties to Native Americans, so we were talking about that, which brought us to the topic of skinwalkers. My friend immediately told me to shut up and change the topic. He told me that names have power. I was kind of annoyed. I wanted to talk about that, and yet I immediately got shut down. Who cares about names anyway, I thought. This is stupid Harry Potter type stuff. Shortly after we went to bed, I woke up in the middle of the night 
to screaming. But it wasn't human screaming. It sounded like a deer, but all sorts of wrong. Deer are common in Philmont, and I had heard them make sounds before. But this sounded distorted and wrong. The screaming continued for at least two more hours before finally stopping. By then, I was on edge, but my exhaustion got the best of me, and I eventually fell asleep. The next day, we got up early and thankfully arrived early at the campsite. As night fell, I put last night's events behind me and went to sleep as usual. That night, I slept well. We woke up extra early in the next morning around 3 a.m. It was going to be a long hike, and our guys wanted to get a bit of a head start. I was late getting out of my tent and packing my bags, so there was a small point in time where I was left alone in the dark, packing my stuff. Suddenly, the screaming began again. Just barely in my view, I saw a boy with a headlamp walk into the forest. I started yelling and screaming for him to turn around and go back to camp, but I was too far away, and soon his light disappeared into the forest. I don't know if these events are related, but it left me very on edge. Things were fine for a while. I'd hear the screaming every now and then, but nothing would come of it. Finally, we arrived back at base camp, and when we finished our trek, me and the guys settled in and prepared for our last night. I heard one of our crew members calling my name from his tent. He asked if I could shine a light outside because he thought he saw something through the flaps. Annoyed, I got up, grabbed my flashlight, and pointed it outside. It all happened so fast, but just as I pointed my flashlight outside, I saw a pale, white, and bony leg disappear behind a row of tents. It looked like the leg of a horse, but with an elongated human foot at its end. I was in shock. I told my friend I hadn't seen anything, and I just lay in my bed, clutching my knife. The screaming began again, and that just made the situation much worse. I got a little to no sleep. I was very eager to get out of there. All that matters is that I'm gone now, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. If you could take one thing away from this story, it is that you should never taunt something that you don't understand, something that you don't want to come after you. Because I got lucky. It just decided to give me a little scare, that's all. Please take it from me, though. Don't mess with legends, because they might decide to mess with you. I wasn't alone on my five-day camping trip, from Afraid of Velcro. I live in a small town in central Kansas. This happened a few weeks after New Year's. I was getting ready to go on a little adventure. This adventure of mine was only going to be a five-day camping trip with my dog and myself, but it ended up being longer than expected, and you'll find out why in a bit. It was January 23rd, and the snow had just finished melting around my area, so I thought it'd be fun to get out of the house for a while and take a few days off. After a few days of planning and getting all of the gear I needed for the trip, I packed everything up and began my trek. I'd be hiking from my house all the way to a small mountain and back. This little mountain was about two days away, but I could make that trip in a day if I cut through a large forest near my house. I would come to regret that decision. Anyway, I'd brought my dog with me to keep myself company. His name is Bullet, and he's a fully grown male German Shepherd. Things didn't start to get weird until after I'd gotten to where I was camping, so I'll just get straight to the point. I had arrived at the spot on the mountain where I was going to be staying, and I decided to let Bullet off his leash to go explore his surroundings. While he explored, I began to set up my tent and trap cameras that I brought with me. I had just finished up my tent when I heard Bullet barking in the distance. 
His bark sounded far away, and I didn't want him to get lost, so I decided to go bring him back. I was only about 10 yards into the woods when I heard bullets bark, but it was somehow right behind me. When I turned around, my blood ran cold. Standing just 10 feet away from me was a giant humanoid-like creature. I'm talking at least 10 to 12 feet tall. I reached to my side to grab my cold python, but I remembered that I'd left it in my tent along with my other gear. I was standing there for what felt like forever when this creature opened its mouth and made the exact same bark that I'd heard from Bullet. This thing barked once more before he jumped over me and ran back into the woods. I called out to Bullet and ran back into my campsite. I know I should have left after all of that, but I couldn't just leave this beautiful place. Plus, being back at the campsite with my gun and with Bullet, I felt safer. To help myself wind down, I decided to cook some of the beans and hot dogs I brought, and I would just turn in for the night. I was just finishing up dinner when I heard this eerie scream cut right through the air. When Bullet heard this, he ran inside my tent, and I couldn't blame him. I followed him into the tent and grabbed my cold python revolver. I stayed awake for a while, staying attentive to the sounds around me, but eventually I fell asleep. Nothing else happened the rest of the night. Nothing else happened for the next few days either, not until my final day there. I had just finished breakfast when I saw a giant shape at the edge of the tree line. I knew exactly what it was. I didn't hesitate to grab my revolver and fire at it. It suddenly made that same scream I'd heard a few nights before, and instead of running off, like I expected, like I hoped, this thing made a growling noise and began to run towards me. When it charged us, I called for Bullet and ran into the woods with my revolver and him. I ran for a good 10 minutes when I found a log that I could hide in until I knew for sure it was safe. I pushed Bullet into the log first and I crawled in behind him, hoping that he would stay completely quiet. We were in that log probably about an hour. Only then did I feel safe enough to crawl out of the log. Once I did, I looked around. Bullet came out of the log and together we bolted back to my campsite. Once back, we found the place entirely trashed. My tent had been torn apart, the fire had been crushed, and the trees all around the campsite were smashed. After that, I packed up my bag and anything that was still in one piece, and I ran as far away from there as I could. After about an hour of on and off walking and running, I decided to check my map to see how far I was to the nearest point of civilization. When I pulled out my map and looked at it, I almost passed out. I'd been going the wrong direction for over an hour, and I knew that I was more lost than before. The nearest civilization was a gas station, and that was over four hours away. When I looked down at Bullet, I saw how tired he was. I walked around for a while, until I found this little hut next to a lake. The place was just big enough for myself and Bullet to fit into, so I put down my sleeping bag and put down Bullet a little bed and blanket. Then we hit the hay. When I woke up, I told myself that we were getting home no matter what. I hoped that that thing was far behind us, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Just as I was about to leave, I looked down the hill and saw that same creature staring back at me, as if it had been following me, watching from a distance. I pulled out my gun, firing the remaining three shots at it before running back up the hill. Bullet was running alongside me, but he got in front of me after a while. We walked for about an hour before I heard what sounded like voices. Relief and hope rushed over me. I ran straight towards those voices. 
When I found the source, I saw a group of hunters at a small cabin. They must have seen me, because they waved me over, and as I got close, I guess I looked completely shook, because they all asked me if I was okay. I didn't hesitate to tell them my story, and they all laughed. Not that I can blame them. If I was one of those hunters, and someone came out of the woods and told me that they had been chased by a giant, monster, humanoid thing through the woods, I would have laughed too. They laughed until that same eerie scream cut through the air again. They went quiet, and so did the woods around us. They told me they'd give me a ride in one of the trucks, and they drove me all the way back to my house. When I got back, I told my family my story too. As I unpacked, my uncle came into my room and told me he believed me, because that same thing happened to him when he was younger. After looking more into this creature and this encounter, I believe I saw the devil himself. <laughs>